The sheer concept of Pokemon is what I'd say is the series' biggest selling point. For more than 20 years, 8 generations, and in the midst of some pretty vocal and substantial complaints from fans about a variety of elements in the series, it is still a monster in modern gaming, and it still sells very well. And for me, that is because the core concept of obtaining and bonding with these cool creatures, helping them grow stronger, and becoming the champion of the land by defeating other trainers, just scratches an itch that keeps people coming back for more. But as much as I do enjoy this core concept, my experience is a bit different, and the reason that I continuously play and enjoy these games comes down to one thing. The settings. For me, the regions of the Pokemon games have been the biggest draw, the largest positives, and the main reason I keep coming back. Immersion is the primary reason that I play video games apart from storytelling, so what I always paid most attention to since Generation 1 was how the worlds of each game were crafted. These are never among the grandest or most intricate settings that the medium has to offer, but there is undoubtedly a lot of thought put into most of them, and they are what scratch that itch for me. Each time I replay an old game, I re-immerse myself again. Each time a new game is announced, while others are clamoring over the new gameplay mechanics or the Pokemon designs, I find myself asking the same nerdy questions. What is the climate of the region? How is it laid out geographically? Do the types of Pokemon that live there make sense? Does the music enhance it? What is the culture and lore like? Is it cohesive? What are the themes of the game, and do they integrate with the setting? What is the atmosphere and lasting impression of the region? Again and again, these are the things that I evaluate in these games more than anything else. I've been impressed at times, and disappointed at others, but the fact remains that this is what I value. And that is why Generation 4's Sinnoh has always been a favorite of mine, from the first time I played it as a kid in 2006 until today. It just taps into something quite special as a setting, and hopefully I'll be able to give you a good idea of why I feel this way. Sinnoh is an island region inspired by the Japanese island of Hokkaido and the southern part of the Russian island Sakhalin, as well as Kunashir. These islands have a pretty variable climate, but they are cold for a decent portion of the year. And this translates to Sinnoh being the northernmost Pokemon region to date, and the one with the coldest climate. This allowed the region to be quite creative while maintaining a theme. It isn't quite as out there as the hugely imaginative towns that characterize Hoenn, but there is a great deal of variability. From sandy, mellow beaches in the south, to marshes, to a vast network of mountainous tunnels forming the skeleton of the region, to nostalgic port towns and desolate bergs, and even more variety. Sinnoh has a lot to see. But I think that what makes it special is that it is tied together with extremely cohesive geographical design, theming, and lore. I'll get to the rest in a bit, but in terms of geography, there is only so much that can be communicated with the limited hardware of the Nintendo DS, yet regardless, Sinnoh has a distinct, robust feel to it, simply through its locales and how they interact. There is such a beautiful sense of logical geographical progression to this region, with the transitions between areas being so smooth, which is not something that I can say for every Pokemon game. A quiet lakeside village in the south is a short hop away from a beach town, from which you can go north to see a sprawling metropolis hub, from which you can go west to find a secluded fishing hole and a quiet port, and from which you can go east to find a mining town carved into the side of Mount Coronet, which naturally divides the region in half all the way up until it ends in the quiet wilderness of Snow Point, seemingly at the edge of the world. A luxurious beachside resort transitions into marshy wetlands before the land gets less wild and more well kept, and we visit the aristocratic segment of the region, with the world building integrated in every step of the way. I'll discuss the specifics here in more detail, but what I'm saying is that despite the variety, it all transitions naturally within itself and flows organically, all generally characterized by mountains and pine trees to reflect the relatively cooler climate and by a musical score that keeps a consistent tone while being catchy and fun, and surprisingly emotional and resonant sometimes. 
While I've always been one to say that realism really isn't as important as believability in fiction, setting design in terms of geographical cohesion is an exception to that for me, which partly explains why I find Sinnoh to be so good. It all fits into itself, and feels like it could be a real place, which really helps with immersion. It's an identity that makes it very evocative as a setting. When I think of Sinnoh, I think of a comfortably chilly place characteristic of my home country of Canada. Dense forests, the smell of pine as the wind blows through the trees, towns blanketed with snow, and most of all, a sort of spiritual, poetic aura that ties the place together. The starting villages of Twinleaf and Sandgem Town don't really offer too much in terms of culture and lore, and more or less serve as a couple of tiny towns to acclimatize the player to the game mechanics in classic Pokemon fashion. But the aforementioned climate is immediately introduced as we're plopped into a town with a distinct feel of a forest settlement, one with a little bit of snow if you're playing Platinum. Additionally, the adjacent Lake Valor is essential for introducing one of the major plot and lore elements of the region, and for just being one of the Sinnoh exclusive features that helps it stand out. Kanto had the iconic landmarks of the Pokemon Tower and the dark secrets of the mansion, Johto had its traditional towers, Hoenn had a lot of stuff, and one of Sinnoh's defining traits are the three lakes that are tied to the myth that forms the backdrop of the story. So establishing this feel early on, and having a short little scene with Cyrus, is very important for laying foundations. The fourth generation is contemplative. And these elements, the Cyrus scene, the quiet lake valor, the relatively more mellow music, and the cooler climate, it all helps to emphasize that early on. Sand Gem doesn't serve much of a purpose other than to house the Pokemon Lab and serve as a connecting point, but it's notable that despite the upbeat music and the sandy beach terrain, Sand Gem still feels like an autumn or spring seaside town rather than a summer one, thanks to the climate and geography established prior, and that is pretty key in keeping in tone with the region. We then move on from these small towns to the self-proclaimed city of joy, Jubilife City, which is a stark contrast in scale to everything thus far. Obviously the size of the big towns in these RPGs tend to be scaled down, but regardless, Jubilife is a sprawling metropolis built on the foundation of what used to be a huge mountain. It is the technological hub of Sinnoh, home to the Poketch Company, Sinnoh's TV network, the Trainer's School, and the Global Trade Station. It serves as the starting point for a lot of elements in the game, properly introducing Team Galactic, explaining the rudimentary game mechanics through the trainer school, and basically finishing the tutorial of the game. However, in terms of how it fits into the setting, it's actually the settlement that probably is the most different in Sinnoh, the one that seems the most out of place. That isn't to say that it's inconsistent, because it's totally appropriate for Sinnoh to have a striving technological city, but it doesn't carry the same aura and tone that the rest of the region has, nor is it as nostalgic as some of the later towns. Jubilife serves a very functional purpose, but it just doesn't happen to dig into much of the things that I personally value in a Pokemon town. Although, that is only speaking of the visuals, because I think the music here is fantastic maintaining an upbeat tempo while still carrying the same understated tone that would become a theme with the rest of the region. That aside, overall, Jubilife is a nice way to broaden the setting and sort of shock the player's system after the smaller first two towns. If we keep moving chronologically, we reach Orberg City next through the cave known as Orberg Gate, and this is where the game properly begins building its world. Being a city that is nestled in between rock from every direction other than the north, Orberg is a mining settlement. As it is blessed with natural resources, the society and economics revolve around the work that people do in the mines and the neighboring towns. And the consistent little details that surround this element really help to immerse. One of the main draws of the city is the museum, where the fruits of the town's labor are displayed for all to see, which totally makes sense given the identity of the town. Also, the bluish vents that are seen throughout are used to replenish the otherwise stale atmosphere from within the mines with the fresh, cool, mountainous air from the town to ensure that the miners constantly work in good conditions. Overall, there is a substantial and impressive amount of thought put into Orberg. 
not only through how it functions within itself, but through how it fits with the rest of Sinnoh in terms of world building. And this is another example of geographical cohesion. As I mentioned, the neighboring Jubilife is a town built on land carved out by a mountain. Well, it just so happens that the miners from Orberg used their skills to help build Jubilife in the past. It makes sense, it's natural, and it's consistent with how rocky and mountainous Sinnoh is. Most may not care about this sort of thing, but I sure as hell do, and these little touches really further my appreciation for the game. That's not to say that the other generations don't have this sense of interconnectedness, but it's more substantial in Sinnoh than anywhere else for me, and it'll continue to crop up as we move along. After Orberg comes Floroma Town, which is understated but nicely additive. There isn't much to do here aside from some stuff with Team Galactic, but it adds a surprising amount to the complexion of the region through its atmosphere and origin. With a modern culture formed around the abundant flowers and the honey that the Floroma Meadow produces, it's a calming and peaceful place, which again feeds into that spiritual and contemplative aura established early on with Twinleaf. Through this, Floroma contributes to a nice bit of atmospheric flow to the games. From quiet early on with the starting towns, to robust enthusiasm with Jubilife and Orberg, to peaceful again with Floroma. It's an engaging and variable progression while maintaining tone and keeping things balanced. But as I alluded to, this town contributes in more than just a functional way through its origin and history. In the past, Floroma was once an empty, dead, barren hill with nothing growing on or around it. People would try to plant flowers, but nothing would grow. However, one day someone came by and prayed a prayer of gratitude, wishing for a bountiful blessing, and the place suddenly bloomed. It is likely that Shaman, being the gratitude Pokemon capable of bringing forth natural life such as this, answered the prayer and formed the foundation for Floroma. From here, people gathered and the place became what it was shown to be in the game. It's a neat little bit of lore that ties in with a Pokemon legend, but it also brings up a theme that has been touched on a bit already, one that is characteristic of Sinnoh. Connection, sentiment, and a gratitude for all that life offers. And we'll soon see that this is a primary theme of the game, one that can be found throughout the region and narrative. After Floroma, the Valley Windworks are a nice bit of world building by being a plant that uses wind energy to form electricity, while also fitting nicely into the environment. And then past that is one of my favorite areas in the game, and in Pokemon in general, Eterna Forest. This place is absolutely beautiful. To me, it's like an area in an entirely different dimension altogether, while somehow totally fitting in with Sinnoh's atmosphere and themes. The trees are thick and suffocating, making the forest seem drenched in perpetual night, except for the small rays of light that make their way through the tiny gaps. It's very evocative. You can almost smell the earth and feel the still atmosphere. To me, it just feels like a place completely stuck in time, yet simultaneously one that is a relic of the past due to the abandoned and haunting old chateau. The music is somber and melancholic while not being too sad, and overall it's just a masterstroke in atmospheric and immersive game design by my estimation, a triumph of the Nintendo DS's capabilities. Making one's way out of Eterna Forest, we reach one of the oldest places in Sinnoh, Eterna City. Now, I love Eterna. It keeps that Sinnoh aura through its subdued and low-key nature, but aside from the old chateau, this is where the setting first properly introduces what will become a major theme. The past. History, culture, and times gone by. Eterna's motto is history living, and it's very indicative. This is an old city, with the galactic building in the north throwing everything else into sharp relief. And it's a town whose identity is the faded, yet substantial heartbeat of times gone by. But this sort of thing in an isolated setting is hard to pull off without some sort of anchor, and Eterna's is the centerpiece of the town. The statue of the legendary Pokemon, with a barely legible inscription on it just hinting at a long past yet not quite forgotten, culture. And as such, walking through the small town of Eterna feels like walking through history. 
The intrigue surrounding the statue is heightened through both Cyrus and Cynthia's fixation on it, as they reflect on the current state of the world and how they feel about it. The rustic music is an acquired taste, but I really like it. It reflects the quieter nature of the town, while also being evocative of the faded past through how, I don't know, rusty it sounds. Sinnoh is a region with an eye for the past that constantly reflects on how the world became this way, and this idea is consistent throughout the region. From cultural habits, to random NPC dialogue, to artifacts and relics and more, and this theme begins in Eterna with this statue. After conquering the gym in Eterna, most of the western region of the map has been explored, so the player must pass through the divisive Mount Coronet to continue into the mid-game and towards the eastern aspect of Sinnoh. And the first thing to greet us is the thriving and homely Hartholm City. The motto for Hartholm translated from Japanese is where hearts touch each other, and that's a great summation of the city. It is said that Hartholm was once a small, simple place where people and Pokemon gathered. As a result, it eventually and naturally developed into a bustling, developed city, but never really lost that theme of connection. It is the biggest and most populated city in Sinnoh, and it houses the grand and illustrious Super Contest Hall. But apart from that, it has an undeniably small town comfiness due to the sense of community within it. You see mothers with strollers outside. You can visit Amity Square, where trainers are able to take their Pokemon for a relaxing walk and interact with others. There's the Pokemon Fan Club, where people can express their love for their partners. There's even a church, where townsfolk can go to worship, pray, and feel that sense of connection once more. Essentially, Hardhome continues with the theme of connection and appreciation that was established in Floroma, but in the context of a much more active and bustling city, which not only keeps the theming consistent, but also contributes to that atmospheric balance I mentioned, providing some much needed energy after the downtime in Floroma and Eterna. The story of the game then naturally takes the player east, on the road to Salacion Town, but before then and just south of Salacion, there is the Lost Tower. Like Lavender's Pokemon Tower in Kanto, or Mount Pyre from Hoenn, this serves as the burial site and place of remembrance for deceased Pokemon in Sinnoh. Within it, there are all manner of grieving trainers dealing with their sadness in different ways. As I alluded to, this sort of place isn't exclusive to Sinnoh, but due to how it ties in with the Sinnoh prominent themes of connection and the past, and due to how the haunting atmosphere exudes a sort of spirituality that Sinnoh repeatedly hits in additional places such as Eterna Forest and the Lakes, it has a bit of extra impact here for me. But traveling north of here lands the player in Salacion Town proper, which is a very small, sort of bump in the road community. It has that classically mellow Sinnoh atmosphere, and the community is tightly knit, but it would hardly be noteworthy if not for the mysterious Salacion ruins and the Pokemon daycare, both of which again tie into those themes of history and connection respectively. In terms of climate, Salacion is noted to be a pretty mild and warm town, and while Sinnoh never really goes full Hoenn, this is an indicator that the eastern part would be a bit more wild and temperate than the west, without ever really going into summer mode for obvious reasons. After Salacion, the player must go east to continue exploring the region. The way of doing so is through Route 215, which is plagued by constant rainfall and a wilder terrain, again indicating a warmer climate than the cool and rocky areas to the west, and previewing more of what the east would be like. But at the end of it all is Veilstone City, which is arguably the densest place in the game. It foregoes that spiritual aura for a sort of self-contained, big city feel due to how independent of a society it has become and due to how isolated it is. Despite being situated near Sinnoh's warmer areas, Veilstone is very much a cold town. Not just in terms of temperature, but geography. Like Jubilife, it is a city that has been formed on top of what used to be rocky mountains, likely again carved out by the residents of Orberg, who no doubt had a much more difficult time traveling here than they did traveling to Jubilife. But due to this, Veilstone has a unique atmosphere. Surrounded by mountains to the east and southwest, and the sea to the north, with gate buildings leading out of the city to the west and south, and almost entirely set up on this rocky terrain, 
Veilstone is alone despite being a big city, hidden by rock. And this is noted within the game. In fact, it's stated that Veilstone has a very limited contact with other towns. And due to this isolation, it is understandable that it would strive to keep its residents satisfied through all manner of things. Veilstone is home to a Pokemon gym, to the game corner, the department store, the Galactic HQ, and more, but its identity lies in the stones on which it stands. Throughout the city, you can find little craters where meteorites have landed, and that tends to be what Veilstone is known for above all. It all lends itself to a very rocky and cold feel, characteristic of Sinnoh. Now, immediately south of Veilstone is an area that is entirely different, yet still consistent at its core with the style of the setting. After a pretty unremarkable yet necessary transitioning area for Route 214, we reach the Valor Lakefront, home to the second of three Sinnoh Lakes, and to the Hotel Grand Lake. This hotel is essentially a beachside resort and getaway, with Sunny Shore to the east, which we'll discuss later, and the sea to the south, this is a luxurious retreat in the middle of what would otherwise be a painfully long trek between towns. Home to individual bungalows used as hotel rooms, a five-star restaurant full of trainers, a pool, and more, an incredibly easy and relaxing atmosphere opens up when the player enters the hotel area, thanks also in part to the sleepy yet comforting music. This continues along the beach, where, Independent of the somewhat limited yet charming visuals, the immersion and atmosphere help the imagination evoke images of cozy sunset beach strolls. Or maybe that's just me. Regardless, what's worth noting is that once again, this doesn't have the feel of a tropical beach at all, and due to the previously established Sinnoh climate, it just seems like a comfortable temperature rather than a hot one. Geographical transitions continue to be excellent as we move west to enter Pastoria City, which is another seaside area but with a different sort of ecological complexion. The area around Pastoria is not as tame as the other areas close to the water such as Sandgem, Veilstone, and the Hotel. This area is much more lush and wooded, much more wild and rainy. In the past, when Pastoria didn't yet exist, there was a natural bog named the Great Marsh, inhabited by countless Pokémon, both rare and common. People sought to protect this as a preservation, and leave it untouched, and as such, a community formed around the marsh that naturally became Pastoria. Not only is this a neat little origin story, but it is once again demonstrative of the game presenting connection and gratitude through how the citizens sought to protect and preserve the Pokémon. The city has since formed its identity around water. The gym is water type, the sea is to the south, there are boats that indicate some sort of transport or trade, and the marsh has become a prime attraction, drawing in visitors from all over to a town that would otherwise be overlooked due to not really being a very desirable destination, especially in comparison to the surrounding areas. It's another example of great and natural world building tidbits that do wonders for immersion, and it's basically the reason that Pastoria has always captured my attention. It is also worth mentioning that this aforementioned consistency in transitions continues with Route 212 just west of Pastoria, as the muddy, marshy wetlands slowly get cleaner and transition into tamer land, turning from mud gradually into much more kempt lawns as we move northwest, eventually reaching the neat, tidy, and flat landscape surrounding the aristocratic Pokemon Mansion, which again, totally makes sense given that we are now directly south of Hardhome. Now, after Cynthia provides the player with some medicine, they are able to pass through Route 10 into Celestic Town, which is not only Cynthia's hometown, but also one of my favorite little areas because of how well it represents Sinnoh as a whole. A tiny, tiny village, isolated and surrounded by mountains and fog, Celestic is the settlement with the most connection to the past. Appropriately given the slogan, The Past Lives, it is a society revolving entirely around paying respects to times gone by and preserving those teachings and lessons. The shrine in the center of town is the centerpiece, and the prevailing evidence behind the idea that this place has been around since Sinnoh's inception, and the Celestic Ruins house several inscriptions that provide the player with substantial amounts of lore and myth. 
Due to this focus on history and culture, and how geographically isolated it is, Celestic feels similar to Eterna Forest in that it's a place segregated from the rest of Sinnoh, where time seems to stand still, to a slightly lesser extent. It is an encapsulation of Sinnoh's aura, and a nice little pit stop in the story. Subsequently, after obtaining the ability to use Surf, the player is finally able to travel to the route west of Jubilife City, across a nice little fishing spot, and into what is my absolute favorite location in Sinnoh. Canalave City is a masterstroke in evocative atmosphere and thematic communication. In terms of layout, the city is divided into two halves by the water, with the pier to the south and the drawbridge connecting the east and west. As a port town on the western edge of Sinnoh, and bordered by forests, mountains, Lake Verity, and the natural seaside fishing route, it exports its resources out to the ocean by boat to the north, and imports in the reverse way. However, while Canalave used to be full of activity due to being a hub for cargo transport, these days, things are less busy and a lot of the outgoing boats are used for travel instead. A big draw of Canalave is how it is used as a means for trainers to travel to Iron Island, which was once a bustling mine that shut down after it dried up. Now, it's solely used as a training area for these trainers. The city is also home to the 6th gym and to Sinnoh's library, and given these attractions, it does just enough to keep thriving as a town while not being loud. But aside from these logistics, as I alluded to, Canalave is interesting for far more abstract and meaningful reasons. Essentially, it is the best representation of Sinnoh in every way. It has quite an atmosphere. There is a boy haunted by a seemingly endless nightmare in the house by the pier, and there is the Harbour Inn, which used to thrive in busier times, but has since been mysteriously shut down. Additional information proves that these events are the result of Darkrai, the nightmare-inducing legendary Pokemon. Now, although the boy can be healed by traveling to Full Moon Island and encountering Cresselia, this is quite a spooky and dark complexion that is added to the town. Yet, it somehow doesn't stop the place from still being peaceful and calm, and just adds richness to the atmosphere and lore. Also, the Sinnoh Library is a big contributor to this too, being a lovely place just to whittle the hours away while reading up on legends of times gone by in Sinnoh. It is an awesome location, and a gorgeous little retreat to allow the player to experience more of the world, if they so desire. As a quiet and melancholic port town, Canalave has this sentimental, nostalgic feel to it that is only heightened given the music, which is not only my favorite track in the game, but a callback in more ways than one. Canalave City's track is a much more laid-back, mellow, and beautiful remix of the end credits theme from the second generation Johto games. It is an evocative and terrific piece emotional and melancholic, but simultaneously relaxing. And all this integrates to make Canalave arguably the biggest thematic contributor to Sinnoh. Again, these two themes that I keep harping on about, the past and sentimental connections, are here in full force. From the library, which presents stories to immerse the player and connect with Sinnoh's history, to the sailor just trying to save his son from his nightmare, to the somewhat faded nature of Canalave, a once thriving port hub now slightly forgotten and turned into a stepping stone for trainers to progress. Not to mention that the song connects the player to the past in a meta way through bringing forth memories of Johto. It is appropriately understated, but Canalave does so much with so little and is almost lyrical in execution. After doing all that needs to be done in Canalave, the player is more or less forced to progress through Mount Coronet to the frigid, snowy north and what I would consider the second best area in the game. Snowy areas in video games have always been an inherently spiritual soft spot of mine, so I am a bit biased, but Route 216 and Lake Acuity are both awesome locations that are geographically and environmentally consistent with what one would imagine the northernmost part of Sinnoh would be like. And making our way into the town of Snowpoint continues that. Here, we have another port town, but while Canalave and Pastoria were connected semi-substantially to the rest of the region, Snowpoint is on the edge of the world. 
A winter wonderland of perpetually falling snow blanketing the ground, it is everything a quiet, icy berg should be. Reflective, warm, atmospheric, the music soft yet enrapturing. A small city without much to do, yet one that simultaneously stands on its own as memorable and carries forward the Sinnoh aura in full force. For any sort of Pokemon fan who enjoys setting cohesion, immersion, and atmosphere, Sinnoh is an absolute joy, and locations such as Eterna Forest, Celestic, Canalave, and Snowpoint are big reasons as to why. Preceding a trio of incredibly atmospheric and subtle towns, Sunnyshore City is much more impactful, yet it impressively carries through the theme of connection and sentiment to the finishing line through a combination of plot, characterization, and little setting details. Sunnyshore is interesting in that the majority of its energy source is harnessed from the sun, collected by solar panels that form the roads that people travel on. It is yet another port town, but it's a much more energetic one than the other ones due to the population, atmosphere, and music. Yet, it is still consistent, as I mentioned. Jasmine, who is the Olivine City gym leader from Johto, can be seen in the city as another reminder of past games and another connection, and she mentions if talked to that this place is a reminder of her home. Now, the player was not able to travel into Sunnyshore previously due to a power outage, which is pretty fitting world building again, but after stopping Team Galactic, power has returned. And this portion of the story involves trying to convince the Sunnyshore City gym leader, Volkner, that he has not lost his passion for battling and that there is more excitement to be had in his life. This is achieved if the player defeats him. However, as heartwarming as this is, the full thematic impact of it can't really be described without establishing some other things first, so I'll ask you to just hold this thought as we conclude. Geographical identity, nuance, and cohesion are elements that make Sinnoh great, but what propels it into fantastic is how it integrates with the culture, narrative, and established lore. Pokemon has always been a series that backloads its lore through the cultural roles of the legendary Pokemon, with Sinnoh being the region that uses this sort of storytelling the most, in my opinion. And it does this through myths, told through the Canalave Library, the relics of the past, and through simple word of mouth. I've already talked about Shaman and how it is relevant to Floroma, but there are a few other legendaries that I'd like to bring up. Firstly, there is the iconic duo of Dialga and Palkia, the creatures of time and space respectively. These two are part of the Creation Trio, which also includes Giratina. But for the point I'm making here, Giratina isn't quite as relevant as the other two. It is said that Arceus, the original one and the god of this universe, created the world at the Spear Pillar at Mount Coronet's peak. At the same time, it created Dialga, who was said to control time, Palkia, who was said to control space, and Giratina, who controls antimatter and was banished to the distortion world for deviant acts. Dialga and Palkia were then given reign to situate themselves in their own different dimensions, but their root and origin was and will always be Sinnoh. Dialga is able to alter, travel through, and regulate time in any way it pleases, with Pokedex entries confirming that time began moving the second it was born. Palkia, on the other hand, has the ability to warp space and create alternate dimensions, and the distortion or stability of space is dependent on its whims. The two are very temperamental, and have been known to get into conflicts with one another, which is naturally a terrible thing that anyone in existence would want to prevent for obvious reasons. Now, there is also this generation's more traditional sort of legendary trio, the three lake spirits of Mesprit, Yuxi, and Azelf. It is said that upon the creation of the universe, Arceus brought forth these three Pokemon and gave them the ability to bring balance by calming Dialga and Palkia. Not only this, but more specifically here, Mesprit, Yuxi, and Azelf are said to be the creatures who originally taught humans how to feel emotions, how to learn, and how to have willpower, respectively. The being of emotion, the being of knowledge, and the being of willpower. It is said in a separate story from the library entitled A Horrific Myth that the Lake Guardians are also somewhat cursed. 
According to legend, if one looks into Yuxi's eyes, they will lose their memory. If one touches Mesprit, they will lose the ability to feel emotions. And if one hurts Azelf, they will lose all willpower and never be able to move again. As such, the three Pokémon try to prevent cursing others in this way. Yuxi keeps its eyes closed, Mesprit avoids humans so it cannot be touched, and Azelf's spirit is capable of entering the bodies of others so that it cannot be harmed. Essentially, these three were birthed to calm Dialga and Palkia, to bring these benefits to humans, and then to prevent them from losing that which they bestowed upon them. They each rest deep in their respective lakes, maintaining balance and prosperity in the world, and they do not move unless forced to. These legendaries all breathe structure, essence, and purpose into life in Sinnoh. Without them, there will be no emotion, no knowledge, no will, no sense of space and time. Existence would be pure futility. Existence wouldn't exist. And that is why this region is characterized by these two themes of the past and of connection. Teachings of these Pokémon, and the purpose that they serve, are never totally allowed to be forgotten. Faded but not lost. Not to mention the more mundane yet powerful relationships that any given trainer can have with their Pokémon. Sinnoh constantly reflects on the past to never forget these roots, and constantly imbues itself with the sentiment to never forget how important these connections are to life. It cannot properly exist without these things that Pokémon provide, so the inhabitants' ways of life and customs pay tribute to that and express gratitude. All of this feeds into why Cyrus is a pretty great villain. Because he is ideologically antithetical to the values of those who inhabit the world, and as such, cannot conceptualize these things and wants to destroy it all. Cyrus states throughout the game that his goal is to destroy the world and start it anew. He grew up in Sunnyshore, and was always diligent and hardworking, but he found interacting with people to be difficult and much preferred the company of machines. As such, he grew up alone and isolated. Ultimately, his behavior meant that he disappointed his parents and betrayed their expectations, and he was extremely disheartened by their rejection. He then came to the conclusion that emotions and spirit were the reason behind all of the pain in the world, which kickstarted his plans in the story. Essentially, he wanted to create a quote-unquote perfect world with no emotion or sentiment, no attachments, so that all can function flawlessly and painlessly, and work as a well-oiled machine does. But while you can see where he's coming from in a sense, that sort of thinking counteracts the purpose of existence for so many, and Sinnoh itself is a counterpoint through how the place constantly looks back on the past, and remembers its history, and how things became the way they became. The Lake Guardians fight to maintain this spirit, and the other legendaries breathe life into it and stabilize it for others to prosper. And the beings of this place acknowledge this through how they remember, and they pay tribute through these connections that they form. Simply put, for Sinnoh, a world with no spirit and feeling would be no world at all. And so, this cycles back to Volkner's situation that I mentioned earlier. He shares a couple of distinct parallels with Cyrus. He's a man who grew up and resides in Sunnyshore, and one that felt aimless, lost, and as if the world had rejected him. The difference? The player is able to be there for Volkner and reignite his passion for life in a way that no one was quite able to do for Cyrus. If the player travels to Route 228, they can talk to Cyrus's grandfather, who states that he deeply regrets not having tried harder to be there for his grandson that maybe he could have saved him. Cyrus became the way he became due to isolation and a lack of connection, but that is why this theme is so important. Because it can save people like Volkner from becoming lost. It can make life worth living. And as such, Sinnoh, a region defined by this sense of sentiment and spirit, is as an entity, an antithesis to all that Cyrus stands for. The world is flawed, yes, but it is also beautiful. And there is value in feeling things as those throughout Sinnoh do, and as Sinnoh itself does. 
It's an idea that you can feel in every corner of the region, a sort of abstract and unspoken thematic convergence that can be felt through all of this that makes these games a joy to play through and explore. Many thanks for watching.